thank you for coming to our webinar today on yes you can scan and more what fair use allows in a short-term emergency my name is meredith jacob and i'm at the program on information justice and intellectual property at american university washington college of law where we do a lot of work on creative commons licenses and copyright and fair use for educators and work like this is a part of helping people understand the ways in which copyright law actually can enable as opposed to inhibit uh, teaching and learning. And um, on the next slide, we'll see what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about um, sort of the scope of the problem we're facing right now with a specific focus on how different student populations are differentially impacted by um, the crisis, how the emergency is affecting all students, but um, affecting some who have started out at a place of greater emergency, and then go into the questions of how copyright and specifically fair use can enable a transition to emergency online teaching in a way that reaches as many students as possible and is most in the way that enables them to be uh, provided with equitable access, including for students with disabilities and students who are facing unemployment or poverty during the transition. And then we'll go through um, some discussions about specifically the ways universal design and design thinking can enable broad access to online teaching and learning, and then have some time reserved for Q&A. So if questions come up through the uh, presentation, please go ahead and drop them into the online question box. Um, we won't be calling on people verbally, so if you do have a question, please put it into the um, Q&A, and we'll go over those um, at the end of the event. Thank you very much. So um, on the next slide, we'll talk briefly about the big picture of challenges facing college and university educators. So, you know, this is really a scope of both what people are facing in the moment right now, where, um, they are facing this emergency transition to online teaching where many students went home for spring break imagining that they would come back and where they don't have the teaching materials that they normally face we're also seeing students who have a huge amount of disruption in um, their work in their family situation and trying to create teaching and learning resources that can meet them where they are to talk about the sort of broader experience that different students are having we have josh bullock josh is the scholarly communications librarian at the university of kansas schulenberger office of scholarly communications and copyright and in this role josh provides services and instruction regarding copyright fair use and author's rights thanks josh yeah, thanks Meredith, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak and um, for paying attention to this important issue um, so you know we know that many on-campus jobs uh, the kind of jobs that students work on campus are gone and the kind of jobs that students have off campus like serving uh, and retail positions are uh, closed. Parents or spouses and other uh, financial supporters of students may be out of work. Um, students may have new childcare responsibilities and so on and so forth with the sort of like new environment that students are um, working in and trying to, to learn in and be students in. Um, and so we know that students have been precarious before and now it's going to get worse and that's particularly true if this persists into the fall which i think we have uh, every reason to believe that it may um, so we're, if we're online in the fall we want to consider what this means for our practices um, how we're thinking in terms of providing institutional services and support um, what does it mean for the experience of different groups of students particularly vulnerable students and how do we avoid replicating or amplifying inequalities in this new environment um, so next slide so the um, first, oh, sorry, it's the typical student slide. Uh, back one. So uh, thank you. First, we need to complicate our understanding of what a, a traditional or normal or typical student is. Um, students are increasingly diverse. They're from less privileged economic backgrounds. They may be the first person in their family to attend college. Um, or they may be otherwise non-traditional, which itself points to an outdated idea of what a traditional student is um, and so what what many or most people believe is a quote-unquote typical college student experience 
or a typical college student is disconnected from actual students and their experiences. And vulnerable students are disproportionately impacted by the current circumstances, like lost jobs, like more dangerous jobs, um, like if grocery store uh, employees um, due to um, potential exposure, inability to work from home, and um, these sorts of things. Um, so uh, the next slide. Um, this is a story from All Things Considered on NPR in early 2017. Um, Sarah Goldrick Robb is, uh, she's at Temple University. Um, she, she's a professor of higher education policy and sociology. And she's quoted in this story, which is on the, the rise in the number of hunger and home, hungry and homeless students um, at universities and colleges. Um, and the day that this story aired, it's February 8th, 2017, I was on campus at the University of Texas at Arlington with the Open Textbook Network, which is what the logo in the upper left-hand corner indicates. Um, and we were talking about, it was exactly this slide. And the people in the room at the time said, oh yeah, we know about that. We have a food bank here. Um, and at the time, we, the presenters, were surprised to hear that but in the ensuing three years, I've been to 10 other campuses to talk about these issues, and every single one of them has a food bank. Um, so it is highly likely that your students are hungry or homeless or at risk of becoming hungry or homeless. Um, and um, Sarah has also written a, a really great book that I imagine many attendees have read um, called Paying the Price, um, where she explores this growing number of students um, who may be supporting families. Um, they may be even co traditional college-age students who are sending, working and sending money back home. Um, but she documents this food and housing insecurity among college students at both two and four-year institutions. Uh, next slide. Uh, so students are borrowing an ever-increasing volume of money to cover ever-increasing education costs um, to what is supposedly a human right for the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. So here you see credit card debt in purple against student loan debt in gold. Um, you can see the volume of the big economic collapse in 2008, after which we appear to have become a little more responsible uh, in our credit card spending, though you know, there's an upward trend there, um, so maybe not as much um, until recently. Um, and student loans never checked up or re even reacted to the economic collapse in, in 2008. So, um, they're borrowing to cover a complex mix of costs, and one of those things is course materials, um, and that's approaching $2 trillion, um, the amount of national student debt in the United States. Next slide. Students cope with um, these increased costs in a variety of ways. Um, we know that course materials are a contributor to this problem. There are multiple surveys that, uh, that track that. This is one of the better known of those surveys. It's called the Florida Virtual Campus Survey. Um, it's been conducted twice, and I, maybe, a, maybe a third time, but I haven't actually read it yet or tracked it down, but in 2012 and 2016, over 20,000 students at every public secondary institution in the state of Florida answered this question. Uh, has the cost of required textbooks caused you to do the following? So two-thirds report not purchasing a required text. Uh, about half take fewer courses, just less than half may not register for a specific course because of the cost of the text. Uh, about a third earn a poor grade, about a quarter of them may drop a course, and about one in five uh, may fail a course as a result of cost. Um, so this is one of the only, this, it matters because course materials are one of the only spaces that as educators, uh, we have the opportunity to influence. Like, I can't drive tuition at my institution down but I can advocate for instructors to select materials that are costless or low cost, uh, because as educators, we select that content. And too often we have historically done that without sensitivity to, or even awareness of the cost of the required materials. So it's a, it's a classic principal agent dilemma. Next slide. Um, so here's another survey. This one's from the National Association of College Stores. So this is campus and uh, college and university stores. Um, and the, in this one, students rank their course materials uh, highly as a, as a cost challenge relative to other significant costs, significant costs topped only by tuition. So we, we tend to think that course materials pale in comparison to other expenses, but here you see that, that that's not the way that students experience it. Um, and like, you know, how, how well could 
we all absorb a two to three time annual cost that can vary by hundreds of dollars. So like even on, I'm a uh, dual income, I don't have kids, uh, my spouse and I both have university salaries and we would, I think, find it difficult to budget for and navigate uh, a cost two to three times a year that could fluctuate between a couple or a few hundred dollars and up to a thousand dollars. Next slide. So um, here you have more um, students co coping in a variety of maybe un unhealthy or unwell ways. Um, students may skip meals or medicine. Um, they might uh, skip purchasing required content altogether due to cost as was in the previous slides. Um, or they may access older editions uh, and try to navigate the, any differences that may exist. They might opt out of homework systems knowing that that will negatively impact their grade. So just forfeiting whatever uh, percentage of their grade is um, conducted <laughs> online homework systems. Um, they can be late on rent or car payments. Um, this information on the slide was a conversation that happened or from a conversation that happened on Twitter uh, last August. Um, where a student reached out to an instructor wanting to know how much plasma she needs to donate in order to buy her books. And uh, so the students are literally forfeiting vital fluids to buy course materials. And that's such a known phenomenon that plas plasma banks actually market to them, um, which is jarring. Um, so next slide. So these, all of these conditions, everything I've just outlined was true that, you know, this all precedes this current situation. So these conditions were true six weeks ago um, and they're worse now and will worsen further in the coming months. And I think we have every reason to believe that the, this event, you know, will reverberate through economy and, you know, social uh, implications for years um, and vulnerable students which is a population that are, is going to grow as previously not vulnerable students find themselves um, in less disadvantage or more disadvantageous uh, fiscal circumstances will be disproportionately impacted um, by the current crisis. And so if we accept there are a lot, that there are lots of students um, in the conditions that we've outlined and struggling in, in these circumstances, you know, what are we to do? Um, we needed to be aware of these issues before the crisis but it's of vital importance now. So, you know, what is the impact of, uh, of bandwidth, of format, of synchronicity, of access, of cost, of privacy, um, of accessibility? Um, and all of these things are of increasing importance. That, that's all I've got. Thank you very much, Josh. That's a lot. I don't think you have to finish on that note. Um, <laughs> and as Josh said, I think the reason we started here is that it's really important as we think through the ways that we plan on delivering materials in this crisis and in the fall to make sure that we're not imagining a sort of static single student experience. There are going to be students who have bandwidth issues, who have trouble finding safe places to work, and so we want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the full range of copyright flexibilities to meet those students where they are. Um, to tell us a little bit about that copyright system that we're operating within, we have um, Will Cross, Will is a lawyer and a librarian, and he serves as the director of the Copyright and Digital Scholarship Center at the NC State University Libraries. Thanks for joining us, Will. Thank you, Meredith, and, and thanks, Josh, for laying all that out as well. Uh, as you both said, the situation is that students and educators are face facing acute concerns in light of the pandemic, but that those issues are really exacerbating the chronic issues of inclusivity, of accessibility, of digital divide that our students are always wrestling with. And I'm sad to say that for too many educators and administrators, copyright can wrongly be understood as yet another barrier to making resources available, right? So it, sort of in response to that, in the next 10 minutes or so, I want to suggest two things. First, I want to suggest that copyright loves and supports education. And if you think to yourself, gosh, I bet copyright doesn't want me to do this teaching or make these materials available, think again, because copyright is a system that's designed to support, not impede, uh, the work that we do in higher education every day. And secondly, that fair use is one of the most powerful tools we have for making sure that copyright serves its intended purpose of supporting access, teaching and learning in this moment and every day as well. So I'm going to lay a little bit of foundation and then hopefully tee up some other folks to give you some specific case studies. 
So yeah, thank you so much. Let's go on to the next slide and talk a little bit about the structure of copyright. So if you've been able to attend our Copyright Basics webinar or to review it and it's on the web page, you've heard me say this already, but I wanted to say it here because I think it's really critical. When you think about copyright, think about a system that's grounded in an idea of balance. That copyright is designed to be about balancing users' rights and creators' rights in different ways. And the way that balance plays out in the structure of copyright is copyright sort of is a sun that shines on a lot of things. A lot of things are touched by copyright, but the control given to rights holders is limited in a lot of significant ways. And I want to talk through those briefly as a way of teeing up sort of what we can do in the context of this. So copyright is really broad in the sense that if something is original, creative, and fixed in a medium where other people can see it, it's subject to copyright protection. We commonly talk about this in terms of literary, artistic, or musical works, but, but if it's original, fixed, and creative, copyright might have something to say about it. Uh, copyright is also broad in the sense that it happens automatically and it lasts for a really long time. Under our current system, copyright lasts for life of the author plus 70 years or 95 years for an institutional author. So what that means is if it's automatic and immediate, you don't have to register it or put the little circle C under it, and it lasts for a long time, that just about everybody on this webinar, listening into this webinar, is a rights holder in one way or another. If you've ever written an article or a paper or a book, you're a rights holder. But also, if you're sitting here going, oh my God, I can't believe we're talking about copyright. I'm gonna go on Twitter and back channel and talk about how boring this thing is. Good news, you own copyright in that snarky tweet as well, right? Copyright is ubiquitous in that sense. Um, I also wanna say that although copyright does last for a long time, it doesn't last forever. And from the perspective of copyright and the copyright system, that's a feature, not a bug. Copyright is designed to create a short-term incentive to get people to create and share works with the intention long-term of stocking a robust public domain that everyone can use. Like Lana Del Rey, copyright is born to die. So those are the ways that copyright is broad, right? Copyright is narrow though, or balanced at least, by a set of limitations and a set of exceptions that are deeply relevant to the work that we do in higher education every day. First of all, while copyright scope is broad in the sense that a lot of things might be eligible, um, the exclusive rights that a rights holder has are actually fairly limited. It's an explicit set of, we often talk about it as sort of a bundle of rights to control what other people do with reproduction, the creation of derivative works, public performance and distribution, etc. But of course, there are tons and tons of things you can do with a copyrighted work that don't fall in the scope of that bundle. So the easy example here is, is most music that might play on the radio these days, or, or maybe on Spotify, maybe not the radio anymore, um, is protected by copyright, but that doesn't mean I can't sing in the shower, right? There's, there's nothing in that bundle of rights that controls my ability to sing badly and off key in the shower, much to the chagrin of my family. Um, so a specific bundle of rights in that sense uh, copyright also doesn't protect a whole suite of things like functional concepts, names, facts, or ideas. Um, so the sort of pithy example of that is if Meredith and I decide to write a book together about a young wizard who goes off to wizarding school and makes friends and has adventures, we can do that. Nobody owns that idea. If we call that young wizard Harry Potter and he goes to a place called Hogwarts, things start to get a little more complicated. But the underlying idea of Harry Potter isn't protected, just like the theory of gravity isn't protected, just like uh, a different theory that you might teach in the classroom isn't protected as well. So a lot of the, the fundamental work that we do of sharing ideas and information, copyright doesn't necessarily impact. Um, and that's often the case with sort of charts and graphs, presentations of factual information that are more descriptive than creative, might also not be protected. Um, worksheets that we hand out often, right, the structure of the worksheet isn't protected. And then the instructions on an assignment, if they are sort of merged with the, the idea piece of it, might not be protected either. So copyright has this set of limitations that are fairly significant. Um, copyright also doesn't protect a lot of other things that are sort of cousin rights, uh, trademark, patent, uh, trade secrets, those other things aren't protected by copyright because they're sort of separate areas of the law that don't necessarily impinge on what we do. And then the big one for educators is that they're often surprised to hear that copyright doesn't have much to say about plagiarism. Who, you know, who gets to be first author on this article? Or does the graduate student have to be listed as one of the authors on the article or not? Those are 
terribly important ethical and professional questions. Uh, if you do them wrong, you can get in big trouble in your peer community. You can be seen as a bad actor, but you're probably not going to get sued in that space as well. So copyright sort of ironically doesn't address one of the things that's the major coin of the realm in higher education. Ethical, not necessarily legal in that sense. So those are the limitations. The second way that copyright is balanced and that the sort of exclusive rights framework that we've talked about is balanced is there are a whole slew of exceptions where Congress or the courts have said, copyright's purpose is to prom promote the progress of science and the useful arts. If we applied copyright strongly in this area, it would get in the way. Copyright would not be functioning as it should have been, instead it would be inhibiting that progress that copyright is designed to support. Uh, the easy example for teachers or instructors is Section 1101 of the Copyright Act says explicitly, it's okay to perform or display a legal copy of a work as long as it's done in the course of face-to-face -face instruction and it supports your pedagogy in some way, right? So if you want to play a song because you're studying jazz, if you want to show a movie because you're studying the history of animation, if you want to have students stand up and perform the play, you can do that. And you don't even have to worry about copyright and you don't even have to wrestle with the fair use stuff we're gonna talk going forward. Congress just said as a matter of policy, these people, educators, doing this thing, face-to-face -face instruction, shouldn't have to worry about copyright so much. As a librarian, section 108 is where a lot of the stuff that I think about, interlibrary loan, personal copies for instructors, unsupervised copying equipment, all that kind of stuff lives there. And there are many areas like this where Congress has basically said for Religious institutions, don't worry about singing sacred songs in the pew. For agricultural fairs, don't worry about copyright in this space as well. Those sort of specific exceptions are an incredibly important part of the limitation on copyright that makes it a balanced system that privileges the work we do in higher education explicitly by carving out areas and sort of implicitly by sending the signal, these are special people doing special things. We want to point in that direction and say, educators, you're doing something we think is important. So know that and take that mantle and, and sort of be empowered by that. So that's the specific exceptions. What we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking about is the other piece of the pie, the sort of exceptional exception, the fair use doctrine. And let's jump into the next slide to talk about that a little bit more. So if the specific exceptions are about these people doing these things shouldn't have to worry about copyright, and fair use is the exceptional exception, what I mean by that is that fair use as written or and as originally created in the courts and then uh, sort of adopted in the Copyright Act of 76, basically said, in addition to those people we've identified, there are lots of people making lots of uses we couldn't necessarily have anticipated or at least that we couldn't possibly have enumerated. There are millions of different uses. If we enumerated them, the copyright statute would reach to infinity, right? So uh, fair use is best understood as sort of a safety valve for those unenumerated, unanticipated, socially valuable uses. And that idea of unanticipated sort of hits in a couple different ways. First, there are a lot of uses that weren't anticipated by Congress when they created the Copyright Act in the 1970s, right? The 76 Act, uh, passes in 1976, goes into effect in 78, but it takes maybe a decade or so to create a piece of legislation. And the legislators creating that often had mindsets that were informed by their lived experiences before then. The result of that is the former Register of Copyrights, Mary Beth Peters, famously said that under the current law, we have, quote, a pretty good 1950s Copyright Act. And technologically speaking, that's often the case, that, that Congress just didn't anticipate reading aloud online or streaming media or all these different sort of things. So fair use is a tool to fill the gap of uses not anticipated because of time or technology. Fair use also fills the gap for uses that were not anticipated because the sort of people who are in Congress don't necessarily reflect all the users in the world, all the people making cool things in the world. So an example here is that there's a a pretty good body of scholarship and some law that suggests that the practice of creating fan fiction is strongly, impl strongly implicated by fair use in a lot of ways. But it might not shock you to hear that Mitch McConnell hasn't spent a lot of time thinking about how we can protect the fair use rights of fan fiction authors, right? Congress might not think to protect that creativity, that engagement with culture, but that doesn't mean it's not valuable and valid and fair use exists to fill that gap as well.
And then finally, and most relevant to what we're talking about today, fair use exists to address uses that weren't anticipated because of exigency or spontaneous need, right? There isn't a specific copyright exception for doing education in the time of COVID-19, right? They, they didn't write an exception for that because they couldn't possibly have done that one, right? But we do need a safety valve to make sure we can do the work, the teaching and learning that Congress has signaled is important without a specific exception. So fair use fills that gap as well. If you look at the statute for fair use, you will see this famous list of four questions, right, that, that you have to think about the why, the what, the how much, and the what economic effect, or sort of what substitution is happening. Um, that was Congress's attempt to take an existing body of case law and sort of quantify it in certain ways. Even in the statute, they say explicitly, these are four questions. They're not the only four questions. They're not a co-equal set of four questions, etc. But there's this period in the 1980s when a lot of current lawyers learned about the law where fair use was sort of finding its way. And then in the early 1990s, something really important happened that changed fair use in a fundamental way and made it what it is today, which is one of the most important tools for education and one of the most surprisingly consistent tools for supporting education, maybe surprising given how much fear, uncertainty, and doubt you sometimes hear from people, either because they have a vested interest in it or because maybe their understanding is a little bit outdated. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about sort of how to apply fair use, but keep in mind those two ideas. It's really powerful. Um, and it's surprisingly consistent. So next slide, please. Right, so if you've ever been to a fair use presentation, you probably heard the purpose and character of your use, nature of the original, the sort of mechanical four-factor test. What happened in the 90s was that the Supreme Court identified and began applying a way to sort of synthesize those four questions into this two-part test that we talk about as in terms of sort of transformative use. Um, and the questions are what you see up here on the slides. Are you doing something new or different? Does your creativity shine through? Does your, do you, does your new way of thinking about things shine through? Are you standing on the shoulders of giants to reach higher? And then if so, is the amount that you're using, whether part or the whole, and certainly fair use supports many, many uses of an entire work, is that amount appropriate or not? So when I bump into a fair use question, these are the first two ways I start thinking about it. Is this transformative or not? If it is, is this the appropriate amount? And if the answer to those questions is yes, I generally feel pretty confident about fair use in that context. If I'm reading a new decision from a court and early on I see this transformative use, I know I could probably kind of skip to the end because I have a sense of how the story's gonna end out, right? Um, it is important though to say that if something is transformative, it's almost certainly fair use, but that doesn't mean the reverse. If something is not transformative, it still may very likely be fair use. Our friends at Georgia State University around e-reserves have been wrestling with this a fair amount as well. Um, and John's going to talk about another decision where this question about whether something is transformative is part of, but not the entire conversation. So that's sort of the way to think through fair use is with those two core questions and then the four factor test as maybe a backstop under that if you need to do it. Um, let's look at some examples now of specifically what fair use looks like in action, what we are pretty confident it supports, and then maybe some warning flags or caution areas as well. Um, this is a, a very, very non-exhaustive list of the things that we know are fair use in action. We put this list together uh, because either these are things that are explicitly mentioned in the statute as when we say fair use, we mean commentary and criticism, so we can be pretty confident or there are specific cases where a court has ruled this sort of thing is fair use. If you're illustrating an argument, if you're promoting accessibility, if you're developing new educational materials, etc., that's very likely to be fair use. And we think that from our own reading of those questions we talked about, but also because we've gotten some backup from courts or the legislature or both in that area. So if you're doing this sort of thing in the course of your educational work, you should feel pretty good about fair use and the way it's gonna support what you're doing. On the other hand, and next slide please, fair use isn't just sort of an automatic get out of jail free card. You can't just sort of waive fair use and say, no, I can do whatever I want, right? This, it's important to, to take seriously these questions and engage with the doctrine in a thoughtful way. Um, and so we wanted sort of in that spirit to point to some areas where the answer isn't no necessarily, but the answer is like, look more closely, be careful. The ice is a little thinner than it might be somewhere else. So tread a little more carefully. Not don't go, but be a little more careful. Um, 
And it, indeed, these are the sort of things you might imagine it would be harder to claim fair use for. Uses designed mainly to set a mood or grab attention, sort of ornamental uses. I don't really need this for my teaching and learning. I just thought it looked pretty well. That doesn't mean it's not fair use, but, but fair use is strongest when there's a pedagogical need for a particular resource, not just an aesthetic one. Uh, fair use isn't as strong for uses that aren't proportionate, right? I, I probably could do the teaching with this third of the book, but I'm going to use the whole book just because eh, it's more work to scan a portion of it or something, right? If that amount and substantiality isn't appropriate, it's not that the answer is no, but it's be a little more careful. Think closely about that one. Um, uses of commercial educational materials is one that I almost always use as an example when I talk about caution flags. But of course, in a minute, Lisa's going to talk to you about a situation where it's absolutely fair use to use commercial educational materials. So that sort of reinforces this idea that these are caution flags, not brick walls that you run into and can't go any further. So that's a very, very quick thumbnail sketch of copyright and fair use. If you want to learn more about it, you can use this link to go and watch that full webinar we did earlier in the week about copyright basics. Um, but I've heard enough of my own voice now. I'm really excited to hear uh, Jonathan and Lisa talk about some specific case studies related explicitly to the work that we're doing right now. Thank you so much, Will. That was a great uh, foundation for us to do this work going forward. Really appreciate it. Um, and as Will said, uh, John Ban is going to talk specifically about a case, Hachi Trust, which deals with scanning whole works and making them available. John is joining us today from DC, where he is a lawyer in private practice whose work focuses on copyright in the digital environment. Among his work, he regularly advises library organizations on copyright, fair use, and access for patients with disabilities. John, thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Meredith, for having me, and, and thanks uh, to everyone who's online. Uh, so the case I'm going to talk about is Authors Guild versus Hathi Trust. It was decided by the, uh, the, the Second Circuit about seven years ago. Uh, it, it's a case that arose out of uh, the, the Google uh, Books project and all of the litigation that arose out of it, as you recall. Uh, Google entered into a partnership with the research libraries and started scanning lots of books. Uh, if you use Google Books, uh, as, as some of you may be doing, you know, you're, you're familiar with, with sort of one of the products. But also one of the outcomes of, of that project was the, the Hathi Trust Consortium. It's a consortium of research libraries that partnered with Google. They got a copy of the scans that Google created during the course of the project. And they have um, uh, multiple copies of, of these scans in different uh, formats at uh, the University of Michigan, the University of Indiana. And uh, uh, w typically, when a person searches the Hathi Trust uh, database, what, you're, what you get back when you query the databases, you'll if you put in a search term, you'll get back a list of uh, books where that term appears and the page numbers of the book. You don't see the full text. However, uh, what HathiTrust does is it provides an additional functionality for people with print disabilities. So faculty and students of the HathiTrust organizations uh, are able to get the full text of these works. Um, uh, typically in a read aloud function or other, some other, some other uh, manner that makes it more accessible. Um, uh, Authors Guild, which is a group of, uh, an association which represents uh, uh, about 10,000 authors, brought suit against both Google as well as Hathi Trust as in the course of this uh, project. Um, uh, the first the district court and then the court of appeals found that Hathi Trust was a fair use. Uh, the court first looked at the background activity, you know, the maintaining all of these copies uh, and then the intermediate copies that could occur when the, in the course of search. And, and basically the court said, yeah, all that stuff, all those internal copies that, uh, that, 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 that are, are being made uh, and in these multiple copies and the backup copies, all those copies, that's all fair use because the search functionality that it provides is so socially beneficial. Um, 
and, and is, you know, supports the objectives of copyright law. It then turned to the provision of full text, uh, making these accessible copies. And the court then also found that to be a fair use. Uh, the court first considered uh, the, the purpose and character of the use, the first fair use factor, and found that it, uh, it really, it, it found that it was transformative because it was serving a different market from the market served by these works. Um, uh, that the, the publishers had basically abandoned this market. They weren't providing, making accessible copies. This was a different market from their, their typical market. And as a result, the court found that, that this was a transformative use. It also found that there was no harm to a market, a typical market for the works, again, because the, this was a market that the publishers had chosen not to serve. Uh, in terms of the amount copied, the court said, well, students with print disabilities or faculty members need entire works. They don't, they can't, it's not necessarily useful for them to just have pieces of works. And so again, that, that supported a, a fair use finding. Um, what was particularly interesting about the court's reliance on fair use is that there is in the Copyright Act another exception that deals specifically with print, people with print disabilities. Section 121 of the Copyright Act allows authorized entities, i.e. entities that provide services to people with print disabilities, to make accessible format copies. The court could have decided the case on the basis of 121, but instead it decided it on the basis of such a fair use. What's so good about that is that um, what it means is not only do we know, I mean, that the reasoning that the court applied for people with print disabilities can easily apply or equally apply to people with other kinds of disabilities, i.e., you know, people who have uh, auditory disabilities or physical disabilities, that they uh, would be able to rely on the reasoning of the Hathi Trust decision. If the court instead had focused just on 121, then, you know, you wouldn't have a fair use finding. Now that we have a fair use finding, we know we can apply it more broadly to other other. Uh, types of disabilities. So it's a uh, it was a great result, uh, and it and and again just to give you a sense of the magnitude of what we're talking about, the Hathi Trust database has something like over 12 at the time had 10 to 12 million books. I think by now it might be even over 16 million books. Uh, so a huge number of works that are being made in an accessible format for people with disabilities. Um, and, and again, it's, it's uh, a lot of books and it's the entire text of books. And so that just shows how far fair use can uh, assist educational institutions when they're supporting uh, people with disabilities. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, and I think that's such an important case to discuss because it, it says really clearly that, you know, you can do what you need to do under the law to reach those students. And to talk about um, the current emergency and how they're working on that, uh, we have Lisa Macklin. Lisa Macklin is the Associate Dean for Research, Engagement, and Scholarly Communications at the Emory University Libraries. And we're so happy to have you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Meredith. And thanks to everyone for hanging out with us on a Friday afternoon and talking about copyright and dealing with the emergency that we're dealing with now. Um, but I think it's, um, an instance where we can draw on the experiences that we've had um, to really serve our faculty and our users. Um, next slide, please. So at Emory, the decision to move to remote teaching happened on the Wednesday of spring break. And so as you can imagine that um, what reverberated across the campus, it meant that our students weren't actually on campus at that time. And um, the students who had left for spring break did not take their textbooks with them. And quite frankly, who can blame them? Um, and we had a lot of faculty who were now finding themselves in the position of having to flip to online teaching. Um, that is not our typical mode of instruction at Emory. We have some online classes, but we are not as strong in that area as there other universities might be. And we also realized that 
not only did we have students without their textbooks, we had faculty who had reserve readings on physical reserves that were in the library building. And we were literally also at this time planning for how we thought we might actually have to close the buildings. So in all of this, libraries can come to the rescue. Next slide, please. So we really um, pulled together um, the reserve staff, the interlibrary loan staff, public service librarians, and really looked at a multi-pronged approach to do what we could do to get students the materials they needed to complete the semester and to help the, um, to help the faculty make this transition to remote teaching. So um, we basically did a lot of outreach to our faculty members and asked them what they needed. Um, we did um, a certain amount of outreach at the administrative dean level who coordinated a lot of things among our faculty. And we set up an internal process in the libraries where um, we started with a question of, can we find the student um, and the faculty member a free online version of the book that they are using in that class? And as you all know, I'm sure there were a number of publishers that came um, and stepped up and made access available. And so that was kind of our first stop. Um, part of that was we prefer to give the student access to the entire um, book if we can. If we couldn't find a free online version, we are fortunate in our collections budget that we um, have been able to do a lot of purchasing of ebooks. Um, we didn't care if we already had it in print. We didn't, you know, we didn't worry about that. We um, would purchase ebook copies. We purchased ebook copies, um, sometimes the more expensive versions that didn't have limitations on numbers of users and push that information out. And when we simply couldn't find an electronic version of the book, we reached out to the faculty member and asked the faculty member, what do you need to have scanned and placed on electronic reserves so that your students can successfully finish the semester? And we put a blog post um, up. You can see the link here at the bottom, but I'll also, after this, post it in the chat session where we outlined this process, um, trying to make um, students aware, trying to make faculty aware that these services were there um, for them. Next slide, please. So thinking about the question of you know, fair use and its intersection, um, we based it essentially on a few things that I think all of us can keep in mind and use to guide us through these kinds of questions. One is what was the need for the remainder of the, of the semester? So as um, Will pointed out so nicely in his overview of copyright and fair use, what is the amount you are using? And is it appropriate to your use? And in this case, the amount that faculty were saying they needed um, to have scanned was the amount of the text for the remainder of the semester. We placed those scans on electronic course reserves. There were some cases where um, either admin assistants or the faculty members themselves had to do the scanning because we didn't actually have copies of the books in the library collection at that um, moment in time. We've limited that to students who are in the class our electronic course reserve system integrates um, within our library um, learning management system. So those con that content seamlessly fills in with the remote teaching that faculty are now doing. Um, and we have asked the students to delete these um, readings after this semester is over. Um, and we hope that one day the students and their books that they have purchased to realize all of these books were books that the students purchased they just no longer had access to that one day they will be reunited but um, quite frankly I don't know if um, that will happen in every instance next slide please so <clears throat> thinking about this that was really much very much our emergency situation where we um, were trying 
what felt like frantically um, to, as I say, move to this remote teaching. Um, and since then, we've gone through and rethought some of our processes to continue to have um, access to our print collections, particularly. Um, Georgia is under a shelter in place order. Our physical buildings are closed um, for libraries on campus. So we've come up with a multi pronged approach where if we get a request from an Emory user through our catalog, instead of just going to interlibrary loan, it will go to interlibrary loan folks and also to librarians. And we first look to see if we can find a free online version. Um, and then if we can't find a free online version, we'll purchase an ebook. If we can't find an ebook, we'll um, have a conversation or email with the requester and we'll see if we can check out the book to them. And if they are in um, Atlanta, we have set up a way to have a no contact pickup where we have a vestibule in the library building. We'll actually check it out to them, leave it in that area. Um, we have limited hours for pickup. Um, we are aware of two things. One, that not everyone is in Atlanta. And two, that maybe coming to the campus is not the best idea at the moment. So if the user isn't in Atlanta, um, we have in some cases literally put the book in the mail to the user and checked it out to them. Um, often these are not undergraduates. Our semester is getting um, closer to to exam time, but graduate students who are working on their dissertations, faculty who are doing their own research, um, you know, have appreciated having these options. So this is a per se a fair use, but it is um, one way of kind of thinking about how you can rethink your services to continue to give access in admittedly limited ways to collections. Next slide. So finally, I want to um, offer a few reflections um, of this period of time that we have all gone through. Um, one that occurred to me very early on when we were really um, scrambling a bit around textbooks and trying to figure out a good way forward, the thought occurred to me more than once that if more of our faculty had adopted open educational resources, this shift to remote teaching, quite frankly, would not have been a very big deal. Um, and so I just think that that um, is something for us to consider going forward. Um, the other thing I want to do is give a big shout out to Hathi Trust. Um, Jonathan Mann did a great job of, of going through the court case um, that Hathi Trust defended on, I think, all of our behalf um, and, and got a, a really great fair use ruling in that court case. What they are doing currently is they are offering an emergency temporary access service. Um, we are members of Hathi Trust, and as part of that, we have applied to Hathi Trust, and they have granted us online access to the print books in our collections. So they're kind of narrowly tailoring um, the access to the scans within Hathi Trust. However, for us, this represents about 40% of our print collections. So it is a significant, um, a significant part of our collections. Hathi Trust is relying on fair use to make this limited online access available. They've outlined kind of the conditions of this um, access on their website. So you're free to go look at that. Um, and a final thought is that in this moment where we have a pandemic on the one hand where we have people needing to get access to factual information immediately on a truly a global scale and our universities are moving to remote teaching and i'm very aware of this in part because we have a medical school that's doing a lot of research in covid and i think we are going to have to wrestle with some big picture questions around how well our current scholarly communication system is really working, um, not only in this time of crisis, but how well it really will work in the future as well. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, and we can go on to our next speaker, and then I'm sure we'll be answering questions as well. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to take the moderator privilege and sort of rearrange just the next moment a little bit, uh, because our next presenter has managed to join us a little earlier than we thought. So um, 
Very happy to have you, James. Um, as we talked about earlier, one of the things that we want to keep in mind in this um, emergency transition is that students who have always faced barriers to equitable access don't have those experiences exacerbated in this moment of emergency transition. So Bill, and if you could go to the slide that's labeled universal design, that would be great. Um, and so James Glapa Grosslog is the Dean for Education Technology, Learning Resources, and Distance Education at the College of the Canyons. And um, prior to his work as online learning, he focused a lot on um, access for students with disabilities and how to think through providing those students full access in the transition to online learning and not making sort of assumptions about how what worked in the classroom will work online. James, thank you for joining us. Thanks so much. I really appreciate being here. Uh, Meredith, is the uh, audio okay? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little loud, but it's fine. Okay, terrific. Well, yeah, I, I, It'll be fine. I talk loud when I'm excited to, to speak about a topic, so forgive me, everybody. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm neither, full disclosure, I'm neither a librarian nor a lawyer, so I might be a, a bit out of water here, but uh, as, uh, as uh, Meredith alluded to, I, I've uh, worked a lot with online education, worked a lot with accessibility, and I'm deeply embedded in the OER community and a great fan of, fan of uh, the Creative Commons work, so I'm really, really pleased to be here. So next slide, please. All right, when we think about universal design, I always like to start with reminding us, reminding ourselves that uh, we're talking about people. Um, you know, I've got numbers up here on the slide, but what we're really talking about with universal design or accessible design is uh, people like us, uh, people in our classrooms, colleagues of ours, people in our families. So let's uh, just take a quick look at these numbers in uh, the entire U.S. population. Uh, the, our best estimate is that a quarter of the U.S. population uh, has some sort of a disability. Uh, in U.S., amongst U.S. undergraduates, uh, nearly one in five uh, reports having a disability. And uh, those reports typically come from students registering themselves with the Disability Services Office on your campus. Um, and you can easily imagine, I think you can probably imagine that not every student who has a disability uh, and perhaps has felt a stigma his or her whole life uh, wants to march into the Disability Services Office on their first day on campus and register, register themselves as being different once again. Uh, so what we find in the community colleges, which is the sector I work in, the sector I know best, uh, we find that students with disabilities are underreported. So uh, in my own institution, College of the Canyons in Southern California, uh, we uh, have approximately 14% of our student population register with our Disability Services Office, but we imagine that it's much higher than that uh, for a whole variety of reasons, ranging from uh, students not wanting to uh, feel the stigma uh, uh, when they're entering upon a new, new chapter of their lives in college, uh, to the fact that sometimes being diagnosed requires health insurance. Being diagnosed requires financial wherewithal to see a medical professional or a, a psychiatric professional. Um, so there are a lot of different reasons and ways in which we probably don't have a full grasp on the number of individuals that, uh, that we're talking about. So I'll still pause on this slide and these numbers and, and ask you to keep in mind when you're thinking about ways to serve your students, our students, uh, during this time in the big transition to remote learning or online delivery, you know, are, are you comfortable or is your campus comfortable uh, with a solution uh, whatever, whatever realm you might be talking about, that simply excludes a quarter of your students or a fifth of your students. That's what we're really talking about. So if you don't already know these numbers for your own campus, I encourage you to know them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and hopefully, this is not a, a new topic for you. I hope, you know, we, we, I know we're, we're all um, uh, very uh, consumed by the news and probably many of us are consumed by uh, the activities on our campus to uh, support our colleagues and our students in the transition to remote and online learning. Uh, yet, I hope that you've also caught some of these news items, uh, some of the, some of the, some, uh, uh, you know, these very reputable 
uh, sources, The Guardian, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and NPR have had stories in the past couple of weeks uh, highlighting ways in which uh, the shift to remote and online learning has uh, presented new challenges uh, for students with disabilities. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to stay in touch with the news. And these, 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 um, uh, these articles are hyperlinked here. So I'm assuming, Meredith, that, that everybody will have access to the slides at some point so you can, you can follow those hyperlinks through. Um, and then uh, next slide, please. I'll leave you, uh, not leave you, but I, I, I will very briefly highlight uh, if this is a new realm for you uh, and you uh, typically work in another part of your, your institution and, and you're wondering how the heck do I ensure that uh, the materials our students are using are, are actually accessible or designed with all users in mind, uh, narrowing in on uh, the content that you might upload to a learning management system or narrowing, that, narrowing in on the type of content that an instructor might communicate or share with students. There are really uh, five easy tips, or I guess suppose for people who work with this stuff, it seems easy. For others, it, it might, might not be easy to, to learn uh, right off the bat. But there are five very doable tips to uh, uh, make most content accessible or fully usable to most users. Um, I'll read this, but I won't explain all of these. Uh, you, maybe you want to take this to your disability services office on campus, uh, call up your instructional designer uh, and ask how to do these things. But these are the kinds of things that, again, will if you implement these, uh, you'll get most of your students with disabilities and most users who have some sort of visual or hearing impairment will be able to profitably use uh, the learning materials. So number one, uh, when you're creating a text, whether it's in a learning management system or just on your computer, use uh, tools that formatting tools that we call formatting styles. Um, that helps a user who might use a screen reader to read the text out loud to understand the hierarchy of information in the text. Um, number two, make links descriptive. If you're hyperlinking to a text, uh, you want to embed the hyperlink into the text, into the title of the article, for example. If you think back to the slides that I just presented, um, the hyperlink was embedded in the words The Guardian and, and the title of the article, so that um, a user, again, who's relying on a screen reader to read the text out loud, uh, knows what the context is. Uh, it's not just a URL that has a bunch of uh, random uh, context-less uh, characters uh, describing the link. Uh, with images, and I hope this is very familiar to, to all of us, uh, with images we want to uh, make sure that, there, that there's an alternative text or an alt text or an alt tag, a lot of different words uh, that people use to describe that, uh, an alt text that describes briefly what that image is so that if you uh, think about hovering your cursor over an image on the computer, uh, sometimes you'll see a little box pop up that has the word uh, one or two words or three or four words that describe that image uh, hovering next to the image. Uh, again, that lets many users uh, who can't fully process the visual image, gives them a way to uh, get the basic information out of that image. And that's particularly important if you're uh, working with a, uh, uh, a science class or a career education class in which uh, students really have to recognize tools and devices and shapes. Uh, in order to really understand what's going on in the class. Uh, another uh, easy tip that uh, I know I was guilty of uh, ignoring for a long time is that in PowerPoint or any slides, uh, slides program, that you're using the pre-populated themes that the uh, producers of that uh, software have given you. So uh, think, about, think about when you go into a PowerPoint to make a PowerPoint. When I used to go in to make a PowerPoint slide, um, uh, I would think, gosh, this is my chance to be really creative. Uh, you know, creative creativity in PowerPoint is, of course, an oxymoron to most of us these days. But I used to think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrange everything on the slide the way I want it. So when I uh, would open up the slide and I'd see the boxes uh, that Microsoft would give me, the, 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 the pre-set pre, uh, boxes that they would give me in, into which I could put my content, First thing I would do is delete those boxes. I, you know, get out of the way, Microsoft engineers. I'm I'm more creative than you. But what I was doing was actually uh, preventing 
uh, a lot of users uh, from actually understanding or per even perceiving the content uh, that I was providing on the page because those boxes, those templates or themes in PowerPoint uh, and also in Google Slides um, have, a, have a code embedded in them and have a structure uh, in, in reflected in that code that gives information to a reader or a viewer about the hierarchy of information. So it's really important not to, not to mess with those boxes or themes that are already there. Um, and again, uh, the final one, number five, and I'm sure this is, this is well known, especially for the librarians here. Uh, if you're dealing with, uh, with, cap with videos, make sure that you add, vi add captions to the videos if they're not already captioned, or better yet, select uh, videos with captions. And I'm guessing that this might be a, a real issue. This one might be a real issue for a lot of library colleagues today. Uh, in which you have faculty coming to you and saying, gosh, I, I, I can no longer do this thing, convey this information in a physical classroom. Now I have to convey it to my students using these videos. I found these videos online. Will you please purchase these videos or license these videos for me to use? And uh, uh, a well-trained librarian is gonna say, gosh, Yes, but we have to make sure that they're captioned. Uh, and I can imagine a lot of back and forth sometimes um, with faculty members uh, who have selected or are promoting uh, the use of videos that are not captioned. Um, and a librarian say, well, we have to have them captioned. Uh, now, uh, under, I hope the under fair use, and I'm, as I said, I'm not a, not a lawyer, but I would like to think that under fair use, and I know this is, this is the case in my state of California in our, in our uh, regulations around uh, community colleges, we are uh, able legally to modify the video by placing captions onto the actual, uh, actual video file uh, as a means of making the content accessible. So I would be curious to hear from, uh, from the legal folks on the call uh, if that's something that's, that's uh, widely understood. But the larger point here is that with all of this content, with all these little tips, um, it's easy to do and legal to do if you're using a Creative Commons license, right? If you're dealing with open license material, uh, the simple fix for accessibility is right click and edit, right? And, and continue, of course, to honor the license and, and give, give, give attribution and, and honor the other, other uh, uh, in terms of the license. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Thanks for indulging me. And uh, one more slide, uh, Meredith. And, and these are sort of some, some things that, that I see on my radar things that I'm really concerned about, I see uh, happening very quickly uh, in my world, uh, again, of the community colleges, um, in making this transition from face-to-face uh, -to, -face to remote and online. Uh, many of us are spending a lot of time in Zoom. We're Zoomed out or over-Zoomed these days. Um, when you think about uh, the choice, or when you're working with faculty, we're trying to make the choice between synchronous tools and asynchronous tools, synchronous meaning live and asynchronous meaning delayed, like in a, in a learning management system. You know, I know a lot of faculty really like this, this, this kind of idea of the give and take in this live uh, interaction via Zoom or other web conferencing systems, but, uh, you know, we, there are some concerns uh, around equity and particularly our, our students with disabilities with synchronous interaction. Um, it's possible that your students with disabilities were able to find their way to your face-to-face -face classroom with the assistance of an aide, um, with the assistance of many people who were available outside the student's home to help that student, maybe help that student get dressed, maybe help that student sit up, maybe help that student prepare for the day um, in different ways. Uh, now the student's at home without uh, that support system perhaps. So uh, insisting that the students show up synchronously and show up live on video may uh, force that student to reveal things about uh, his or her condition or living situation uh, that they're really not comfortable doing. Uh, and that's not only for our students with disabilities, but certainly for our students who uh, might not have a, a, a financial stability to have a, you know, to have a house that they want to show off. Um, so, you know, I really encourage you to uh, make sure that that's widely discussed on your campuses with, with folks who are, who are thinking about synchronous versus asynchronous. Another issue that I see that's uh, highly concerning to me is, uh, discussing with faculty how to do assessments uh, in an online environment. Um, and I know that this is a, a significant issue for uh, 
uh, courses that require hands-on experience, uh, whether it's nursing or, or welding or science laboratories. There's a real concern about how do you do a legitimate assessment at a distance. Uh, all too often, a default tool or the first tool that people grab onto is something that our, our fabulous ed tech companies are providing us, uh, and that is uh, online proctoring tools. Uh, and they come in all, all kinds of different flavors. Uh, however, uh, if you, you, know, you think of, about the proctoring tools for a second and what they actually detect, you know, think about the little box that I'm in right now. Um, you know, if, 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 um, if I'm a student who has some neuromuscular uh, issues or Parkinson's or uh, I have trouble sitting up straight um, or I have uh, uh, ADHD and it's difficult for me to sit still for a long time, there are all kinds of reasons why I might uh, move in a way that puts, puts parts of my body outside the box. That would create a false positive. That would create uh, tell the proctoring tool and tell the, tell the instructor and tell the institution that I'm cheating. Uh, and I would be repeatedly branded as a cheater. I would be re re repeatedly branded as someone who's suspicious or untrustworthy. So yet another way in which we uh, would make our students uh, with different abilities uh, or with health issues feel unwelcome in this new classroom. And, you know, boy, don't, don't get me started on uh, skin tone and skin color and telling telling some of our students that they need to shine a brighter light on their face because their skin tone is different than my skin tone. You know, that's a whole nother uh, long discussion or long, long, uh, uh, unpleasant lecture, I suppose, uh, for many of us. So a uh, lot, a lot of concerns about uh, those proctoring tools. Just encourage you to really think carefully about uh, assessments. Uh, and then another, another uh, development that I see emerging rapidly is um, faculty, particularly in the laboratory sciences, wanting to use all kinds of very expensive and wonderful, uh, fancy online lab simulations. Uh, and I've been involved in the past month, been involved in with, with reviewing and vetting a whole bunch of them. Uh, and uh, not all of them are designed for uh, universal use. Uh, pretty simple. And not all of them have even considered thinking about it. Uh, the first step, if you're, if you're looking at a software, uh, would be to ask for a VPAT or a voluntary product accessibility template. Hopefully it's familiar to many of you, if not your disability services folks or your uh, technology procurement uh, team will be very familiar with those. And it's simply a, a template or a form uh, that responsible uh, hardware and software vendors uh, voluntarily complete to voluntarily disclose to you um, what elements of their, uh, their tool is accessible to, to all of our students. Um, so it's just a general plea to keep your eyes on the unintended consequences of uh, the tools and solutions we might, I think we're, many of us are reaching for these days. Um, uh, you know, what, what might be an easy solution to a very narrow band of our student population or our uh, faculty uh, is not necessarily designed for the margins of our society, let alone the margins of our institutions. So that takes me back to the first point and, and uh, encouraging you, you to understand uh, the numbers of students that you potentially are disenfranchising if you are not keeping these things in mind. So with that, Meredith, thank you so much. I'm really, really excited to be here. Thanks, and uh, back, back to you, and back to the, the proper order of things. So thanks for adjusting. Thanks for joining us. And so um, my colleague, Peter Yazzie, who is a professor emeritus of copyright law at the American University Washington College of Law, is going to take a moment to sort of frame what we have been talking about in these emergency questions in the larger picture of how to think about what fair use permits us to do to meet our educational goals and our educational mission. And then after that, we'll be taking some questions and talking through some specific uh, scenarios and questions that have come up. And if you're thinking about questions now, this would be a great time to put them into the online box. Peter, thank you so much. Thank you, Meredith. And, and thanks to all our speakers. This has been, uh, I would say, an, an, an enlightening and for a, for a lay person like myself, a, a, a disturbing set of presentations in the sense that that um, 
James and Josh and Lisa have made clear to us how many of the students who are the audience for our extremely highly developed and, and expensive American system of higher education struggle either permanently or occasionally with various kinds of, of challenges that put them at risk of not having access to the best adapted and most flexible learning materials. So some of those challenges relate to, to disability, as we've just heard. Some of them relate to financial insecurity. And some relate to more temporary conditions, like having left your books in your locker when you went on spring break. But they're all barriers. They're all impediments. And the community of, of instructors and librarians and support people are extremely creative and 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 energetic about thinking about uh, thinking through solutions to those those impediments often solutions that involve making smart use of new technology and and this is where the shadow of copyright potentially falls across the picture because as we've heard copyright is kind of ubiquitous system of owner's rights and information that has the potential to, to regulate and even to shut down a variety of different innovative information initiatives. And we don't worry about copyright and its, its, its potential too much when we're in the face-to-face -face classroom, the traditional face-to-face -face classroom. But we tend to worry about it a lot to feel you know, insecure and even 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 fearful when we venture either because we want to or because we have to out of the physical classroom into virtual learning spaces. So that's where another right comes into play, which you heard Will Cross speak about so effectively, and that is if copyright represents a set of owner's rights that can potentially interfere with the accomplishment of mission by educators who want to reach every student with the materials that that student requires, fair use is a set of user's rights. And they are user's rights that are specifically designed to enable, to activate, to empower these kinds of innovative, innovative mission-related uh, activities. And we see now very easily and, and poignantly, and, and Lisa's account is a very good one here, how important fair use is in the current emergency. This spring, perhaps even next fall, as we make our way through the pandemic. But the point I want to make as I turn this back to Meredith and, and over to the questions and answers is that this set of users' rights, these entitlements that permit us to do more with copyrighted information, to give our students what they need are not relevant simply for the duration of this emergency. We are not, I think, ever going back to exactly the way we taught before. At least, I hope we aren't. We are, I hope, and I think we all hope, going forward into an environment in which we're going to make better use of technology to meet the needs of the students that we described earlier. In the short term, copyright shouldn't prevent any of the accommodations that are required to adjust to the circumstances of the emergency. In the longer term, fair use can actually enable 
a new effort or enable new efforts to put high quality, flexible, resilient, and versatile learning materials into the hands of the students who need them. Thank you so much. There couldn't be a better note on which to turn to some of the questions. Um, so the questions that have been submitted, I'm going to try to group um, in to sort of thematic groups. So if you've submitted yours and I don't get to it first, it is not that I am not getting to it. It's just that we're going to group them a little. And uh, Jesslyn, actually, if you don't, or sorry, uh, Bill, and if you don't mind, will you put us on that last screen that has the website address so that people can find where to go? Thank you. Um, so one question we've seen a number of times is um, questions around video. So questions where there is a physical copy of a DVD that's either held by the library or that a teacher themselves have and that they want to stream to the students for discussion. And I think there's sort of two questions there, and maybe Peter and then Lisa, if you're willing to give us your perspective on this. The first question is, you know, can a professor through an LMS or other restricted situation, you know, is fair use accessible to them in making a decision about whether or not they were going to stream this? And then, once the decision has been made to deliver a video, does fair use allow you to go in and edit that to provide captions? Peter, do you want to have a first? Yes, I'll be happy to. I'll answer both of those questions in the affirmative. Um, those are, in fact, straightforward and, and, and non-problematic applications of fair use. They implicate different rights of copyright owners, the right to distribute material and the right to modify or adapt material, but all of the bundle of, or all of the elements of the bundle of rights that copyright owners enjoy are permeable to, can be when the mission requires it and the means chosen is well adapted, be overcome by fair use. And I heard embedded in the question one other possible issue that I wanted to address briefly, and that is if you as a teacher are trying to get these materials, these videos, these audio files, whatever they may be, out to your students, trying to get them out in a form that will make them both usable for all and accessible for those who may have disab relevant disabilities, you can use any copy as your source copy. It doesn't have to be a licensed copy. It doesn't have to be a copy from, an, uh, from a school collection. It can be the old DVD sitting next to your, your DVD player. If that's the source material you have, and if you have the technological means and know-how to do it. Uh, sometimes one hears that the source, it, it's very important to have a, an appropriate source copy in doing fair use. And that is, that's just, that's part of the, the, the sort of the urban folklore of copyright. The, the status of the source copy doesn't matter in the slightest, even if, dare I say, your source copy isn't one you yourself bought. Maybe it's something somebody gave you. Maybe it's something somebody burned for you from another master. None of that matters from the standpoint of your ability to take advantage of fair use. Thank you, Peter. Lisa, um, I was going to give you an opportunity to further comment on any issues around video you've addressed, but I also want to address a second question to you. So do you have any quick answers on video you'd like to add, but then I have another for you. <laughs> um, I would just second what Peter said. What we have found with trying to do streaming um, video is that the technology is actually the greater barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and even the tools that we use, like Zoom and some other things, um, you know, don't always facilitate that in the way that, you know, the, the classroom setting did. 
Um, so this has been an area that we've struggled with at times getting the content to the students, but our struggle is not with copyright. Um, yeah. you know, it, it's sometimes with technology. Lisa's point is a good one. A few years ago, I taught a class about sort of American legal thought and, and, and Hollywood Westerns to a bunch of law students. And I wanted them to watch the movies before we discussed them at length and intensively in class. And the streaming, the streaming options we had were hopeless. Uh, we simply didn't have the bandwidth in the school to deliver crisp and accurate visual experiences. So I burned them all to a, to a thumb drive and gave them to the students. It was the best solution, and it was a fair use solution, despite the fact that it involved not simply streaming, but making a permanent copy. They were, of course, supposed to treat that object with proper respect, and I trust they did so. It wasn't my responsibility to be sure that they did so. But what works is what the law will support if you're doing it for the right reason. Thank you. Um, there's a question specifically for Lisa that focused on your question about the textbook e-reserves -re e and the scanning there. And when you talk about um, textbook scanning, one of the questions that came up was, what if you don't know for certain that each student has possession of a, of a published copy, of a purchased copy? What if some of the students may have been coming in and using a library reserve copy? Did you feel like you needed to think that through, or do you think that you can basically treat all your students as a group there? Um, essentially, the, for us, the, my comment about like, we hope one day the students and their textbooks get matched to back up again is because for us, we literally had a week and two days to make this switch. So um, it was as much kind of a comment on our moment in time in doing that. I have no way of knowing if a student bought the textbook. Um, the faculty member has no way of knowing if the student bought the textbook. So it really wasn't um, so much a consideration in how we went forward, more a, a moment of time which raised the level of, um, the level of urgency around the question. Um, and so the, the other question that was kind of related to that around the semester, summer semester, and that being different than this, you know, emergency moment. Um, if you have been putting print um, textbooks on reserves because you feel that you are filling a need of students not purchasing textbooks, I think my suggestion would be to have a conversation with that faculty member assigning mm -hmm. that text because they a, may not be aware that their students are relying on these library copies instead of purchasing the book. Um, it's also a moment um, to have a conversation around accessibility um, and some of the questions that our speakers have, have raised um, around accessibility both in the um, sense of um, physical and other source of accessibility, but just accessibility as in access to the copies. And then I think your question gets back to um, how much do you really need for students to have for this semester? Um, and really tie, as Peter's example did, tie it to the pedagogy. What is your need for the pedagogy? Um, you know, how much does your faculty member need of these resources for the students for the semester? Um, and have that conversation with the faculty member and let that guide you on your way forward. Thanks, Lisa. Will, did you have something to add? And Josh, I saw you were briefly unmuted. I didn't want to ignore you. Sure. I'll, I'll jump in um, and then leave some time for Josh, too. I just wanted to say quickly, our camp, our library is one of those that works with our bookstore to buy a copy of every assigned textbook. And that does give us a little more confidence in our fair use argument, because there's clearly a different market thing happening there and a different reasonable reliance by our students there as well. 
Um, the second part of that is the sort of what happens after the exigency is over. And the nuance I want to add to that is there's the, oh my gosh, we didn't see this coming piece of it. Like it's, it's, we have to figure this out in three days. That's the strongest fair use case, but students still can't get access to stuff. In the summer semester, we've had some time to think that if there's still not a licensing market and stu students still can't reasonably get access to physical materials, I, I think fair use still looms pretty large there, but I'll be curious to hear what other folks think and also excited to hear what Josh has to say. Thanks. Um, I was just gonna add that uh, my institution is um, supporting streaming uh, or digitization of videos um, in order to provide them to students and had been doing that before this crisis. I have colleagues that presented on it in Charleston uh, in 2018. Um, there's a process and I think there is a requirement uh, and it, like an, an assessment that's applied and I think it does include um, whether or not a legally sourced copy is available. Um, that could be the instructors, it could be the students, it could be the libraries, it could be in the public library, but whether or not there's a, a legal copy available, um, then um, is it available via widely available streaming services like Netflix or Hulu or something like that? And if the answer to that is yes, then we decline to digitize because those things can be accessed fairly um, easily, um, but the, I'll acknowledge not universally. Um, and then I think if the answer is no, then we digitize uh, and um, encourage basic risk mitigation strategies like um, streaming via a closed platform learning management system, um, putting it up for the amount of time that's necessary for students to engage with it and then taking it down, um, those sorts of things. But we, we have been uh, doing that and we'll, I, I have every reason to believe we'll continue to do so. The other thing that it, frequently the context is the need for authentic language materials for students who are studying a language. And so the, the transformative question is, is strong there. Um, so that's a, another sort of um, piece of that puzzle. I'm not officially involved in that process, um, but that is what my understanding of the way that we have done that. If I, if I may for just a moment, that sounds like an extremely sensible and well worked out process. And the only point I would make is that that, that one requirement that the stream be sourced to a lawfully acquired copy is not, strictly speaking, a necessity. It may be prudentially the choice you want to make, but the law of fair use is not sensitive to the question of whether or not the copy in question can be traced back to a a a transaction of some kind. Um, the Teach Act, which we referred to earlier, does incorporate such a requirement, but the Teach Act is not in itself sufficient to support most of the activities that you've just described. Those are, in fact, fair use activities. So the question of whether one wants to import a requirement from this, this very defective piece of, of attempted legislation into the fair use analysis, is a, it's a question for institutions to make, but it's not a requirement. Yeah, and I think that is, it was a policy decision exactly. uh, rather than a legal compliance decision. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell Kevin Smith that you're, you're pushing on that. Please do. <laughs> Say hi. Uh, so a couple of questions here talk about um, thinking through the summer and the fall. So um, as you talked about, Lisa, a lot of the decisions that you made were tinged by the exigency of this moment. Um, and so we get a question, we get a number of questions about, you know, how to think through um, for the summer and for the fall semester, what you can do in terms of making materials available. Uh, you know, I think there's two big categories of textbooks themselves and then other material held by the library. And um, also a question that says, you know, we've talked a lot about providing access for students with disabilities you know, how far does fair use go 
for providing access for students who just can't afford books. There's a lot of sort of piecemeal efforts that libraries have done to try to beef up e-reserves, beef up e-book purchasing, but that can only go so far. Um, and I can talk a little bit about how OER is one part of that, but I wanted to see what you were thinking through at Emory. So um, our fall semester, like a lot of other folks, is a big question mark. How long our libraries closed is a big question mark. So while we did a lot of um, a flurry of activity for this turn on a dime to remote teaching, um, you know, we are in, an, at least for the foreseeable future, a new normal. Um, so our print collections are not available other than by kind of very special um, mediated um, no contact pickup, you know, um, and even print collections and the management of print collections, we have had questions around, you know, if somebody returns a book, how long do we leave it sit? How long does the virus stay on print material? So what it's done for us is really um, flipped even how we're considering collections and pushing us much more to as much E as, as we can purchase. I will say we are fortunate in that we um, do have a robust collections budget that we can make those kinds of choices. And that's not true in, in every library. But as far as like going forward, summer semester, um, I, I fully agree that, you know, fair use doesn't have an expiration date. Um, and that, you know, the things that have been fair use um, and will continue to be fair use are going to be things that we're going to be exploring of how we can get content to our students. And for us, a lot of it is really, as I say, working with our faculty, what is it that's needed to meet the pedagogical purpose? And I think that for us, this does raise the question of how can we better promote OER, um, not only to address the financial questions, but OER enables accessibility and addressing some of the accessibility questions in ways that other forms of access don't. Um, and in ways that forms of um, even ebooks from some publishers don't address as as well. Um, so while we're pushing on buying more ebooks, we are also becoming much more keenly aware of some of the downsides of that um, as well with the way that some of those platforms work um, for students. Thank so I'd, I'd welcome um, Josh and Will to jump in too. Yeah, no, Will has raised his hand digitally. So Will, do you want to unmute for a moment and talk about that? Sorry, I was actually answering a different question in the chat. Um, so, I'm, so I'm playing catch up here. The question is about moving to OER. Well, the questions, we have the question that, you know, cost is a significant barrier for all students going forward. And so we've talked about how much fair use allows you to do to overcome uh, access barriers for students with disabilities you know, does fair use provide the same strength when you're just talking about students who can't purchase the book? And if it doesn't, what does OER provide? Sure, so, so OER provides a couple of different things. First, um, it's absolutely free, right? So that addresses the cost issue. Can you tell us a, a little bit about the baseline, what OER is, where you find it? Yeah, yeah, and good news, we'll have a, we'll have a big webinar on that next week, uh, talking about where to find it in particular. Um, so open educational resources obviously are resources that are uh, freely available and have an open license on them. Um, so you can access them for free and you can use them. And Josh, you should feel free to jump in here as well or other folks. Um, the cost issue is often people's way into OER because it's a really, really significant issue. Um, the fact that the open license lets you make copies that are more accessible or replace the pictures that are all of rich white people with pictures that are more representative of a community, etc., are another sort of piece of the value of that. Um, and then there's the larger sort of open pedagogy, the concept about giving students more agency and, and that kind of thing. I think recently we've been thinking a lot about OER in terms of data privacy and not forcing students to sort of become commercializable units for large for-profit companies. 
Um, I could go on for hours and hours. I know we're already past time here, but but I think the the pitch for OER is the cost stuff as a as a great solution to the question that was raised. Um, but that's sort of the tip of the iceberg as well. Josh, do you want to jump on and add to that? Um, only to say that I really appreciated James's presentation and do not consider myself an accessibility expert. And that's certainly a space where I have a ton to learn. Um, but um, you know, OER isn't magically accessible, um, but the benefit to me as regards accessibility is that all of our institutions have um, disability offices and access services offices that are replicating, making the exact same materials, uh, traditional materials um, accessible for a given, in a given, to meet a given disability over and over and over again and the sort of like waste, not, I don't want to, it's not a waste of time because you're meeting a need, but the fact that we're replicating that so much, um, openly licensed content, once an, a, an accessible version is made, that open version can be shared, which means that another unit can implement it without having to undergo the same um, labor of making it accessible for the same condition. Um, so there's, Openness isn't a magic bullet regard, as regarding accessibility, but it helps um, advance the accessibility of that content. Wanted just to add there a, a sort of historical note, and that is that before the Hathi Trust decision and the firm endorsement that the courts there gave of accessibility as a purpose for fair use and copyright, many, many libraries and disabilities offices have been working under the assumption that they had to digitize afresh for every request, that they could not retain a digital file that had been made for requester one in the sure and certain knowledge that eventually there would be requesters two, three, and 10. And the strong restatement of the fair use rationale for providing accessibility was, this was not the issue in that court case, but the language that the court employed, as Jonathan described it a moment ago, the, the vigor and intensity with which the court endorsed the relationship between accessibility and fair use was enough to persuade most, if not all, offices to revise their policies. So it's a big deal. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm just going to let everyone know a little bit about, I'm going to answer this question and talk a little bit about what we have coming up. Um, you know, for these questions that say, what about our students who can't afford teaching materials generally? What about our students who struggle every semester to get the textbooks for their courses? That, you know, fair use is very powerful in um, enabling teaching and learning going forward, but I do think we will see a limit on the projects that are happening right now to digitize whole textbooks and deliver them to students as a replacement for displaced physical copies. And that fair use does not provide a perfect solution to that in the summer and in the fall, and as we go into more planned online teaching. And I think um, as we go back to school this fall or this summer, many students face the reality that their classes might be interrupted either systematically at the institutional level or for them personally by a transition to online learning from in-person learning by illness by discontinuation of the course and as that happens i think we need to be really careful that we are not asking students to purchase textbooks or subscribe to online inclusive access programs if there are alternatives available that allow them to access materials at no cost and um, one of the key things that I think many of us have worked on are projects to find and adapt and create these open educational resources. So over the next two Fridays, the same time, 
and it could be the same place if you'd like to be in the same place. We are going to do these webinars on next week covering finding OER, so finding and evaluating open educational resources, both textbooks and then also supplemental materials. And then the Friday after that, we are going to cover questions about Creative Commons licensing and fair use that will come up as you support faculty or you yourself author new open educational resources. And then to make sure that we are addressing all of the issues around equity that come up in that, we're going to have three additional standalone webinars on questions about um, universal design and serving students with disabilities when you make this transition to digital learning and OER, um, thinking about how we deal with meeting the needs of communities of color and vulnerable students when we shift to OER, that we're creating materials that are responsive to their experiences and accessible for those populations. And then finally, a much sort of nerdier copyright deep dive on questions that have come up about uh, US-Canada compatibility. There's often a concern that when you rely on fair use when you're creating OER, that it somehow breaks this compatibility. Um, but just as we've talked earlier about how education is a core purpose of fair use, it is in fact a purpose that is acknowledged by every country's copyright law. And so in Canada, we'll see that fair dealing and fair use on this sort of scope of educational use line up more than many people worry. So um, if anyone else has any last words, happy for you to jump on. Otherwise, Thank you so much for joining us. The link here has all the information about those webinars and I'll also email it to you after this one. Thank you again for joining us and have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone.